Good morning, church. Put your hands together. Can you greet our loved ones? Welcome. Welcome to the house. It's so wonderful to have you here. We got a full house today. I got a shouting section. I'm going to hear my amens. I'm going to bring them by myself. Well, glory. Welcome today in the name of Jesus. We're in our 10th week of Sudden Hope. And today, our title, our assignment, suddenly, camels. You're going to learn about camels today because they represent the vehicles God is using to span your desert of discomfort, and they are bringing a weighty burden of comfort to the hearts of God's children. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. God is the God of all comfort. And beloved, I want to encourage you today to dare to look to the horizon and to see that the camels are coming, the instrumentalities bearing the weight of your comfort. You know there's a reason behind all of our acting out. We act out in order to comfort ourselves, even for a moment. People will do almost anything for just a moment. But comfort is the inheritance of God's children. And the Holy Spirit himself is called the comforter. Jesus said, I'm not leaving you orphans. I would never leave you. I'm going to send another one just like me. And he is the comforter. And you're going to know him because he's going to Release such comfort continually in your heart so that you won't feel abandoned and you won't feel lost. Well, here's our text, Genesis 24, 63. And Isaac went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Genesis 24 is the chapter. And it's an interesting chapter. Abraham is old. The father of the faithful is just about ready to die. And his beloved wife, Sarah, has just died. And so Abraham is grieving the loss of Sarah. And Isaac is smitten with grief over the loss of his mother. And in chapter 24, Abraham sends his servant. And he says, I want you to leave the Canaanite area here. And I want you to go back to my home where I'm from, and I want you to get a wife for Isaac, because I'm about to die, and we, do, we have to continue this multi-generational Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thing. So his choice servant, the man who ran his home, that he trusted above all others, he sent out, and the scripture says in chapter 24 that 10 camels were taken. And they were loaded. You know, camels can be 1,500 pounds in weight, and they can bear 1,000 pounds of weight on their back. The camels are known as the ships of the desert. And, beloved, the ship of the desert is coming toward you with comfort you've never had up until now. I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you've done and what you've been. You have never been drunk with comfort like the comfort God has one of his ships in the desert bringing you. Extraordinary comfort is on the way to you. You're t I know some of you are tired of donkeys, and you want some camels to show up. No more donkeys, Jesus. I want my camel. Well, camels are amazing. They're, they're burden bearers. They're desert animals. They can survive longer than any other animal in a barren place. They, they have exceptional senses of smell. They can smell water anywhere. Their eyes are specially protected 
They have 34 long, sharp teeth, and they can eat through cactus and thorn bushes. Do you know if they can't smell water, if they can, they have teeth, they smell, they spit, and they bite. And as with all vehicles of blessing, they always look suspicious. Have you never noticed that? God, <laughs> God always uses unexpected sources to supply our needs. Remember 1 Kings 17, he called the ravens to supernaturally feed Elijah twice a day for his entire time that he was in living in his caves, hiding from the wicked. But beloved, the blessing he's going to bring now is bigger than any individual raven beak can handle. So he is going to bring a full supply line of enormous provision. And for that, he needs the camels. Camels are coming. The camels were a sign of wealth. If you own camels, forget a horse. They're great in the short run, but they cannot be what a camel can be. They're born for the desert. They're born for sandstorms. Their knobby little knees are perfect for their kneeling. Their scorched skin that looks so strange and rough. And uh, I'll tell you, they're not much to look at. But those humps that they have, they don't store the water in the humps. They store fat in the humps, up to 80 pounds of fat, because that's what brings them nourishment. They can go a week without water in the summertime, two weeks without water in the wintertime, and they're perfectly fit for the rugged existence in the wilderness. Sandstorms don't stop. You ever seen the camels and the gait of a camel? That's one thing about riding a camel. I've been dumb enough to get on a camel a number of times in my life. You don't, you don't fight against the momentum of the camel. You go with the camel. You know, it's a ship of the sea. That's what it's called, ship of the, ship of the sand. You need to, the ship of the desert. You've got to go with the momentum of the camel. Don't fight that because you won't win. But they are amazing creatures, and they appear throughout the Bible as vehicles bearing extraordinary weight. And their weight, they're bearing in their process coming to you. They're not carrying cement. They're not carrying iron. The Bible says that Abraham's servant loaded gold, silver, spices, jewels, everything that would be necessary to accomplish Abraham, the father's task, the camels are the ones that bore the father's provision. And we're talking about a lot of camels. There are 10 of them here. And they're sent on a 500-mile journey to find a little girl named Rebecca. Right now, she's a nobody. But we're going to find that she's been rehearsing all of her life for the blessing that's just about to come to her door. Love one, you never know what God has planned for you. Isaiah 60, verse 6 says, Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. God's ships of the desert are coming, and they're bringing gifts of reversal, restoration, re re uh, reward, and recompense. The gifts that are coming to you right now, God sees your unseen service that others never see. God sees your faithfulness. He sees what it takes you to get up in the morning. No one else does. And he is bringing a recompense for all the unseen service that you're engaged in all the time. Beloved, maybe nobody else sees you, but he does. And he sends his servant with 10 camels, and they are bedecked with comfort. In this case, they're going to comfort one little girl. And they're not only going to dispense all of this enormous wealth onto one house, but then they're going to take Rebecca and they're going to put her on the camels. 
and they're going to bring those camels 500 miles back to a young man named Isaac who is in dis-ease and discomfort because he is smitten over the loss of his mother. Beloved, only you can measure in your heart what a significant loss does to you. Isn't it something how others can never understand your loss? You know, men and women, we're different. Men are like, okay, done, get up, run. You know, we're done grieving. <laughs> okay, eh, there I grieved. Someone doesn't understand your loss. You don't even understand why something can represent such a significant loss in your heart. Well, in Isaac's case, it was his mother, Sarah. He was cut. He was wounded. He was not healed. Have you ever had a loss just so large that you just say, I'll never have that again. That's gone. I'll never have it again. Never have it again. Well, watch saying that around the Son of God. Because he says, oh, really? You'll never have it again. Well, God says to many of you that have been experiencing only discomfort, you'll have it again. What's coming toward you in the form of his camels? The, the, the comfort that is approaching you is going to, be, it's going to be exceeding abundantly above and beyond any comfort you could ever ask or think of. Ephesians 3.20. Well, I can think pretty big. I can fantasize a lot. And he goes, yeah, whatever you can think of and fantasize about relative to comfort, I'm bringing it to you. Comfort is ease from grief, from trouble. Synonyms, assurance, contentment, assuagement. Wouldn't it be delicious to not have comfort just to have to knock yourself out for a second of comfort. But to have him inject an IV of extended comfort into your belly, I mean, enough of that spiritual profanol to take Sarah's place, to replace the loss that you say I'll never have again. W watch challenging God to a duel. Go ahead and do it if you want to. I'll never have that again. I'm never going to feel, I will never be comforted again. Okay. God says, okay, we'll see about that. We'll see if I can replace the loss that has so shattered you. Did you know camels, again, they're unclean animals. Remember ravens? God fed Elijah with the ravens. Well, they're unclean because they're scavengers. Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Unclean birds can be touched, but they can't be eaten. All right? So God uses unclean birds to feed Elijah the prophet. Beloved, sometimes our walk has a tension to it. It looks suspicious. Every time God moves, he looks a little weird. Why does he have to bring camels? Well, just, just accept the camels. Amen. Don't judge the camel. I'm no camel going to bring me a blessing. God uses the instrumentalities that he chooses, and they're usually a little bit suspect initially. No raven's going to be. I will never. I'm, I'm holy. I'm not going to touch a raven. Okay, then starve to death. That, see, that offends a religious spirit. That's an unclean bird. Yes, they're to be, you can touch them, but you can't eat them. And camels, they're unclean too. Oh, come on, Lord. Bring some lovely stallions or bring some kind of kosher food that we could eat. Well, you could touch a camel, you could ride a camel, you could use a camel, but you couldn't eat a camel because it was an unclean animal. So sometimes God looks a little suspicious in the means he uses. And as I look across the room, I am confirmed in that fact. Well, hey. 
don't know what my sense of smell just went up about two ticks there, all right. <laughs> they can travel about 25 miles a day comfortably. They can run up to 40 miles an hour. They usually walk about 25 miles an hour. But you don't have a better friend in the desert than a camel. God knows exactly how to match a man with his moment, and he's just about to match these ten camels with a little girl of destiny who needs something that's going to take her 500 miles to meet her beloved. God will come. He will cross any distance to reach you. I keep telling people, don't be shocked if you start meeting folks from the other side of the world. Sometimes God's got to bring you a friend from the other side of the world. <laughs> He's been cooking up your friendships in other countries sometimes. Sometimes your ministry compatriots don't even live in, in, in the country you're in right now. But he has a means of bringing. He can cross any distance to bring you the comfort that he wants you to get. You know, And notice Isaac looked up and saw the camels coming to him. You don't push a piece of string. You pull a piece of string. What God's doing is coming to us. Oh, beloved. Remember Adam tried to name all of creation? And he did. Good job. But he couldn't identify what he needed. So he names all of creation, but he still doesn't find what he needs. And God put him to sleep. Put a tardema on him. Did some surgery while he was out. And brought Eve to him. The Bible says he walked Eve right up to Adam, and he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Did you know it's better when God brings it to you? And you don't have to strive and sweat, and oh my, I'm a human being, I'm not a human being, I'm a human doing, and I think I'm in the bathroom, and everybody, uh, it's just like, what's the matter with him? A little x lax or some prune juice? I mean, you hear the way people talk and the way they pray. and the Is this an inconvenient moment? Can we not talk right now? I can call back. <laughs> Notice the camels are coming. They're coming. It's coming to you. The arrow's been shot out of God's bow. It's on the way. You're not going to have to sweat. Camels don't sweat, by the way. They have an internal thermostat that keeps them regulated. When it's 110, it doesn't matter. See, they're born for adversity. God knows exactly how to get the blessing that he's bringing to you. And there's no devil in hell that can stop the caravan of comfort that's on the way to you. You can't sabotage her. Say, well, I can. You wait and see. No. No, God's about to bring enormous, overwhelming comfort that you would not replace for anything. See, I think all addiction is a hunger for heaven. All of our acting out to find a moment of rest, a moment of peace. You wouldn't judge people so harshly if you saw with an x-ray vision what they're going through. You would wish them to lay down and have some comfort. Jesus sees our discomfort, extended seasons of discomfort. But you know what? He's coming to reward all of our secret service. You know, I think God uses most of us when no one else is looking. You know, they even have cushion rims around their hoofs, like flat leather-like pads, so that they can't sink in the sand. They transcend the sand. If you ever see them in a storm, they're just built for it. Everything about the camel is set for the worst conceivable circumstances. Want to see a good example? Watch Lawrence of Arabia if you want to go back to the desert world and see how this works out and see how valuable camels are. Bible says Job had over 3,000 camels. Hmm? Pretty good. But 
let me just throw this out, a season of reversals is on its way to us through the provision of God's camels. Let me read a few verses from Isaiah 35, 1 through 10. Notice the theme of reversal. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. That's a reversal. It will burst into bloom. That's a reversal. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. That's a reversal. The eyes of the blind will be open. Reversal. The ears of the deaf unstopped. Reversal. The lame leap like the deer. The mute tongue shouts for joy. Reversal. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Reversal. Ooh, isn't that tasty? That's on the way. It's coming to you. For you. For you. I was talking to a friend this week, and I mentioned in the Chronicles of Narnia that it, it, sometimes it's, it's always winter and never Christmas. You know, sometimes in our lives it's always been winter and never been Christmas. That's going to change. Come on, reversal. We just say amen, just say the camels are coming, and they're bringing reversals for me. I'll take it. Thank you. Gimme, give gimme, give my name's Jimmy. Secondly, extraordinary exchanges are on the way to us. Isaiah 61, 1 through 7. The camels are bringing extraordinary exchanges. Listen, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That's an exchange. The oil of joy instead of mourning. That's an exchange. The garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That's an exchange. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. That's an exchange. And renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Can you say amen to that? I was talking to Rebecca today, and I told her, I said, you know, honey, amen means so be it. Amen means clothe me with it. I'm taking it into my heart. It's all mine. Every time you say amen, you're just saying, that's mine. That's for me. I personally accept the camels that are directly on their way to me to bring reversal and to bring exchange. Oh, beloved, may he come and exchange our sorrow with dancing. Are you open for an exchange? Sometimes if you, if you, if you get healed, you have to give up your handicap sticker. Oops. Spare a shekel for an old ex leper. God bless you. You got it. You got it. You got it. If you get the exchange, things have to change. Well, uh, well, that rhymed. And along with the camels coming, transmutations in value are on the way. What does that mean? Isaiah 60, verse 17. Instead of bronze, I will bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze, and iron in place of stones. I will make peace your governor, and well-being your ruler. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if, they, if the camels are coming and they're not carrying concrete? I come bearing much weight. What is it? Spam. <laughs> Cans of spam. Mm. We'll send them to Gretchen's house. She likes spam. They're not carrying concrete. God knows that we need some positive transmutations here. We, we, need, we don't want bra, bronze and brass. We don't want iron. <laughs> we want gold. <laughs> I don't know about you. You know Solomon was so wealthy that they threw silver out with the dung heaps to make room for what was valuable. And you know, camels, camels bear treasure. And you know, we've been seeing this theme over the last few years. The Bible said when Israel was at its zenith that all the Gentiles came to Jerusalem. Solomon was so wealthy. Do you remember the Queen of Sheba, our precious queen? Second Kings chapter 10. 
Well, she traveled 1,400 miles with probably up to 80 camels in the cavalcade. And she brought, as a housewarming gift, I've got it written down, and I calculated it just right. Listen what she brought. Four and a half tons of gold. She brought 236,775,000 pounds of gold as a housewarming gift. On her don on her camels. Forget the donkeys. Camels. No more donkeys, Jesus. <laughs> you don't know the difference. You're a little blind these days. As a housewarming gift, four and a half tons of gold, plus spices. Now, spices, in most cases, were more valuable than gold and silver. I mean, a pound of cinnamon was worth more than most of us would want to see in gold. So the Queen of Sheba, she is just a seeker. Jesus quotes her in, in Matthew chapter 12. He says, you know, the Queen of Sheba will rise up and testify against you all of you residents of Capernaum, because she went 1,400 miles to see Solomon, and a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus said, I've been raising the dead, healing the sick, and I'm God incarnate. I'm your Messiah, and you're just so bored with me, you're eating potato chips at home instead of coming to the sermons because you're bored now. He goes, the Queen of Sheba was a seeker. She was spiritually hungry. She went 1,400 miles with her 80 camels, and they were lo loaded with four and a half tons of gold as a housewarming gift. And the Bible says she came and poured her heart out before Solomon. He answered all of her questions. She sought, and then she blessed the true God of heaven. And she said, Solomon, I've heard about you, but I've, half of what I've heard is not worthy of what who you are and who your God is. And it says her breath was taken away when she saw the table of Solomon, the palace of Solomon, the throne of Solomon, and Solomon himself. It says when you can take a queen's breath away, you've done something. She's seen it all, had it all, done it all, and her breath was taken away. Beloved, beloved, God is bringing all earnest seekers, the Melchizedeks, we call them, the people who are seeking God, but they're not quite there yet. Remember Apollos, the greatest preacher mentioned in the New Testament, that he came from Alexandria, Egypt, but it said he only knew the baptism of John the Baptist, so he was preaching not error, but he just didn't have the full picture. And Priscilla and Aquila took him aside, and they taught him more perfectly, and he goes, and, and he accepted their correction, and this golden-tongued order, Apollos, now has, has been perfectly filled in on the truth of the gospel, and he goes out to the synagogues from the scriptures to prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Beloved, the camels are bringing some Apollos into our lives and into the church world. The greatest preachers of the future may not know him right now, fully and completely, but at least they're willing to go 1,400 miles to here. Do you remember Jesus? Bethlehem is only six miles from Jerusalem, and the religious leaders would not leave the temple and walk six miles to see the Son of God. And the Queen of Sheba went 1,400 miles and brought her camels burdened with goodness, spices, Brought Solomon plenty of what he didn't need. Load it up over there. Throw the silver with the dung. Wouldn't it be nice if God's transmuted? Of a, you know, instead of having a little stock in iron, it becomes gold. That would be a upgrade. Give me, give me. My name's Jimmy. The Melchizedek's are coming. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Did you know, listen, arriving in Jerusalem with a great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind, and she gave him 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spice and precious stones, never again 
were so many spices brought in as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The camels are coming for you. But you know, the punchline, the greatest of all, the camels are going to bring a comfort that you've never known before. Genesis 24, 67 says, Isaac brought Rebekah into the tent of his mother, Sarah. And he married Rebecca. So she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. God replaced the loss. And he will replace your loss. You say, well, I can't, ex I can't accept that right now. Well, you don't have to accept it right now. But I'm announcing it, that the Son of God, is making sure your camels are not bringing cement and iron. Did you know camels can drink 25 gallons of water in three minutes? Wow. A bronze pitcher back in Rebecca's day was two to three gallons. So the scripture says that the servant arrives at his destination with the ten camels and he prays. Listen now. Listen what he prays. He goes, God, please, please let my journey be a success. Please let me meet the little girl I need to meet. Please, God. And, and, and may she be the one that comes out as soon as we arrive and let her say, would you like something to drink? And I will water all your camels. Ever put a fleece out? <laughs> well, this servant put a fleece out. And the Bible says, before he had yet finished praying this in his heart, Rebecca came out with her little Bronze Age pitcher, two to three gallon pitcher, and said to him, my Lord, would you like a drink of water? And he went, okay. And she said, oh, and can I water your camels? Now, camels can drink 25 gallons in one sitting. So that's 10 camels. That's 250 gallons of water. They can drink 30% of their body weight in three minutes. So that's 200 liters of water, 20 buckets of water for each of the 10 camels. All right? So what we see in the text that she watered the camels, you know, and then we go to the next verse. <laughs> in the Bible, 200 years can be covered in between one verse and the next verse. So hold on, hold on. If you could draw a bucket of water every minute, it would take three hours and 20 minutes to water these camels. If you could draw a bucket of water every two minutes, it would be seven hours. Lifting the combined weight of three of the camels out of the well. That's what Rebecca's doing. And of course, the men are sitting there watching this comfortably. Yes, dear. She's Supergirl. This is a superhero. She's good looking. She's polite. She's kind. She's gracious. And no one made her do this. She wanted to go the extra mile. Oh, beloved, God sees your secret service and he knows that you're faithful and he knows that you're doing it because it's right. And he knows that there's excellence in all you do. And just as he saw, this is what Rebecca did the day we're reading about her. She'd been doing this her whole life in some form or another. And the, the servant of Abraham says, God, please let the little girl water the... Well, that's a seven-hour show. If I was doing it, it would be weeks. 
It would be like, let's get through the next chapter of the Bible, please. It's Craig. Yeah, move on, move on, move along, move along. She is lifting the combined weight of three of the camels. She's going down to the well and coming back up and going down and coming up and going down and coming up. And it says, when the camels were all, all, all finished drinking, the seven-hour extended version of the Godfather was over. I'm still looking forward to that four-hour Napoleon coming out, though. I still am. Two and a half hours wasn't long enough for at least God's got a four-and-a-half-hour one, I think, coming out. The director's cut. Beloved Rebecca was an extraordinary little thing. And she did not know when she woke up that morning that those camels that had been coming for 500 miles were going to show up at her front door. And, and listen, it says that the servant had the camels kneel down. This is a season where it's going to be effortless. Your elevation, your promotion is going to come to you, down to you, and pick you up effortless. Remember Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. Always wondered who put that in there. <laughs> It's true. Comfort is on its way. And you know, I just, I, I don't know. I just, we're, we're repayment, replacement, reversal. That's what the camels are bringing to you. And I want us all just, if we could, all the lambs in the house, we just close our eyes before the Lord, join our hearts together. Holy Father, I pray the comfort that entered Isaac's tent that replaced the loss of his mother, Sarah. Rebecca did replace Sarah. He brought her into Sarah's tent, the very property that belonged to his beloved mother because God was filling his heart and replacing the loss of Sarah with a whole new dose of comfort. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, all your precious daughters. Lord. Comfort, comfort ye my daughters. Tell them their warfare is over. I pray as never before, Lord, that you would walk comfort into their lives, into their tents, and you would extinguish all the discomfort and dis-ease. Thank you. And for your beloved boys, your sons, Lord, you love them so much that you would bring a rest and true comfort to your children, to your boys, Lord, your sons. That they would drink in deeply of a comfort they've never, ever known. That they, as the camels, would drink and drink and drink and drink and drink until they are sufficiently sponsified and completely filled. And I rebuke the spirit of discomfort in the name of Jesus Christ and every satanic power that has set this people on edge so that their whole life would be an edgy life. We rebuke those foul, evil spirits. Lord Jesus, in your name, Jesus, we say the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you, foul spirits. Come off of the people of God. Come out of her. Come out of him. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we like we receive your comfort. Can you just say that with me? I receive your comfort. I receive your comfort, Jesus. I receive the exchange. I receive reversals. I receive a transmutation of bitter land. Come, Holy Spirit. We drink to the dregs of your goodness and your comfort in the name of Jesus. And can someone say amen? amen. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. <laughs> and all the Melchizedeks are coming. The Gentiles are coming. There's something about us being comforted that draws people. Because everyone's thirsty. Everyone's thirsty. 
And when we're satiated and we're sufficiently sponsored, that's what draws the nations of the world to where we are. Amen. God bless you. David, come and lead us. May our Father bless the hearing of his word today. That was awesome, Pastor. As we uh, prepare the bread and the cup, you don't have to work for this. <laughs> Jesus already provided it for you. He wanted to have a physical contact, just a, a place of contact that you could receive from him. And may this broken bread as we break it be a comfort to you. God is not punishing you with disease or injury. He's not trying to teach you a lesson. <laughs> he allowed his body to be broken so that yours would be healed. Be comforted in your mind and in your spirit and receive his free gift of health right now. Let's partake. Let's take the cup and be comforted that you don't have to earn your place in heaven. You don't have to deserve your acceptance before the Father because Jesus already paid for it. He already paid for it through his shed blood. Receive your comfort now as we partake. May all the blessings of his sacrifice ease your anxiety and your worries today. Be free from all that conflict and inner struggle and just receive what Jesus already paid for you to have. Thank you, Father. Amen. May it be so in Jesus' name. Oh, praise the Lord. Put those hands together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, I never have as much comfort as when I'm with this host. It's my privilege to be with all of you today. And you're, you're, you're invited into our living room. You belong here, too. And if we feed you or we bless you, please consider feeding and blessing us. There's such a, a beauty of exchange that goes on when those who are fed feed those who feed. It's a delicious synergy. It's a beautiful anointing. Good soil to plant good seed in this house. Help us out if you would. And if we're not feeding you, don't you dare even give us a dime. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance unto you and give you peace. May he lift his face upon you and bless you. Father, we release a spirit of comfort into every home and every heart and every ear. And I pray that you would put tons of comfort that you would drop on your daughter and your son. Just catastrophic, subjective tons that would just crush all despair out, grind out all uh, anxiety, and we receive that comfort. Whatever you have to do, Lord, so that we can drink all of that in like the camels drank the water, we ask you to do that healing and that work because we want to be satiated, fully filled with the comfort of the Lord. As Paul said, comfort one another with the comfort wherewith you have been comforted. So we pray you make us candidates of comfort in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.